That's what I don't care. With this, I open the meeting. Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome to the 5,576th meeting of the Rotary Club of Chicago. And uh, what we are going to do now, um, which will make you think, is show you a video of what you can do with Rotary. And everybody has access to it. So Shelby, could you please show the video? If you think of what interests people have, there's a fellowship for it. You share the same interest, you share the same hobby. Photography is a fellowship. Swimming is a fellowship. There's so many fellowships. Within the last year or so, uh, I've gained so much more worldly friends for fellowship. The fellowship that I belong to is a cycling fellowship, and we're able to raise money for polio um, just by riding our bikes. It's the fact of taking your passions, your hobbies, and taking that into a service opportunity, into a social opportunity. We do learn to surf events for high school kids, beach cleanups, things like that. It's also attracted people who are into those types of events to seek out what is Rotary about. Rotary Friendship Exchange is an opportunity for you to visit new places, learn about cultures, to be received with warmth and friendship. That is the ultimate travel experience in my mind. You get to connect with a family there that will show you around. You explore things you never thought you would explore. And also sometimes integrating local projects. Friendship exchanges are open to anyone. It's something you can do with your friends, your family, your kids. Better than a vacation, hands down best. The great thing about a project fair is that it brings Rotarians from different parts of the world to one venue. When they come, they are looking for projects that can help them to meet their club's goals. The Rotary Clubs offer different projects in different areas of focus. The hosts put together uh, project visits and other kind of tours. People become friends and friendship engenders trust. The personal contact is the main purpose of a project fair. ICC or intercountry committees are an important part for peace and friendship. The intercountry committee operates between two countries. And it's very important for Rotary with the support experts to promote activities and relations between the two countries. Projects are done by the clubs and not by the ICC, but they try to help them to do these projects. Go beyond your borders and do your part to reach peace through service. But if you play tennis, or if you like to sail, or if you like to fly your own airplane, there's a fellowship for that in Rotary. So, and also you don't need to own your little airplane to be part of this fellowship. So, uh, you know, just, I am serious. I mean, it seems so unreal, but yeah, it is true. Okay. And so, uh, so I hope that um, at another time, we're, I think we're going to have a link to the video in our gyrator. So I invite you to look at the whole thing. So a very important announcement that now that you are enjoying your lunch, um, we have, as you heard from previous meetings, uh, new in-person attendance guidelines for Rotary One and the Union League Club. All in-person attendees must pre-register and prepay, prepay if applicable. And this includes Rotary One Golden Wheel members and pay-as-you-go members. Uh, to guarantee a spot, pre-register for in-person attendance is necessary to be done by Thursday at 3 p.m. And walk-ins, unfortunately, are not guaranteed a meal. This is what the Union League Club is telling us. So, um, um, you know, we think it is going to be temporary, but we need to be aware. 
uh, with respect to the meals, vegetarian meal is the only special meal available, and it is available to pre-registrants who select this option during registration. These guidelines are necessary as Rotary One and the Union League Club return to in-person meetings. We are, your understanding and assistance is greatly appreciated. Uh, now, uh, with, re with, uh, with respect to the format of our meeting, uh, we will take questions at the end of, the, of Ina's remarks. For those here present, please hold your questions to the end. And for those of you who are on Zoom, type questions in the chat box. And please honor our speaker's time by keeping your questions succinct. One question per person. Thank you. Uh, for those of us who are here, we will do the, our best to get uh, to your questions. And please honor our speakers and our time by keeping also your questions succinct. Uh, I would like now to introduce Alita Williams, our president nominee. <laughs> here she comes. Alita is the chair of the Job One Committee, our signature project, and she is uh, going to introduce our speaker, Aina Pinkney. Alita, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Ina Pinkney is a Chicago legend of the tastiest kind. Known as the breakfast queen, she fed Chicagoans for over 33 years. First out of a small bakery and then from her beloved breakfast restaurant in the West Loop, which she closed in December of 2013. An undeniably outstanding chef and astute businesswoman, Ina is much more. She's a community leader, a pioneer, a television personality, a former columnist at the Chicago Tribune, the subject of an award-winning documentary called Breakfast at Ina's, and author of a memoir cookbook called Ina's Kitchen. But most importantly, she's the rare sort of person who's found a way to transform her passion into a joy that extended to an entire city and beyond. Ina Pink. Okay, this makes me feel right at home, <laughs> right at home. So Labor Day, 1944, I was 18 months old. My dad came in to the bedroom to take me out of my crib and I tried to stand up and I fell down. And I tried again and fell down. And when he touched my forehead and realized that I had a raging fever, in that terrifying instant, he knew that the polio epidemic that was sweeping New York City had come to Brooklyn, New York. He took me around the corner to our family doctor, Dr. Suna, who had an apartment in our building and a private entrance. And he said, I think we have a problem. And Dr. Suna said, hold her across your belly. I'm gonna do a spinal tap. And he did and went into his little lab in the office and came back and said, it's polio. They took me to the hospital and my father looked around and when he saw the children, infants and children in the hospital and asked about how often families could come to visit and was told once a week for an hour, he looked at Dr. Suna and said, we have to take her home. I cannot leave her here. And Dr. Suna said, I agree, so let's take her home and we'll figure it out. They contacted the March of Dimes, who put me in braces and said, well, we'll see what damage is left when the fever subsides. And it was not good. The leg was already shorter and the shoe, shoe size was smaller. And my father was distressed. March of Dimes changed the brace to a cast because my foot had started to drop. And he had read in the newspaper that Sister Elizabeth Kenny was in New York City. 
She was a nurse who had been in the Army Nurse Corps, where they call the nurses sisters. And he called every single hotel in New York City to find her. And when he did, he begged her assistant to come and see me. And she said, sister would be happy. What hospital is the child in? And my father said, no, she's home. And she said, no, I'm sorry. Sister will not come to a private home. She's having enough trouble convincing the medical doctors of her treatment. So I cannot, I cannot say yes. And my father stewed about that all night long and became more and more distressed when he looked at me and called back again the next day and said, I will do anything to get sister to come and see my daughter. So she finally acquiesced. He borrowed a car, he drove to Manhattan, and he picked up a large woman with a big hat sitting in the back, the assistant in the front seat. And when they got to our apartment building in Brooklyn, she said, the child's doctor is here, yes? And he said, no. She said, I don't leave the car without the doctor. And he went around the corner and got Dr. Suna once again, who escorted Sister Kenny into our little apartment in Brooklyn. My father said when she looked at the cast on my foot, she immediately cut it off and hurled it across the kitchen, saying, we are not treating a broken leg, we are treating polio. And that was the beginning of the hot pack treatments. Strips of wool about 12 inches wide, 24 inches long, into boiling water, three pair of rubber gloves, wring out the boiling water from the strips, lay them around the whole leg, and put dry strips of wool around that so the wet heat would go in. And in those days, we didn't have plastic, so oil cloth, tablecloth, and then massage, lots of cocoa butter and massage. This went on for a very long time. I was not able to run and play with children, and so I sat with adults. And what I learned was adult conversation, and I learned to be a committed listener. When I was six, they told me I was going to the hospital. Now, all the conversations I had heard sitting with adults were that when you went into a hospital in 1949, you did not go to get better, you went to die. So I thought they were taking me to die. And I gave my brother all my toys and I said goodbye to the neighbors with a finality that they could not read. And I went to the hospital. And when I woke up, in that nanosecond of consciousness, I thought they had made a mistake. And I knew at that moment that everybody in my life would get a second chance as I felt I had just gotten. Now, I could not understand my life at all. And I so wished that I could have had a letter to my young self from far in the future so that I could understand what my life could be. Because at that time, I had have no expectations. So I sat down and I wrote a letter to my six-year-old self that I'll share with you today. My dear Ina, you're going to begin your life in the hardest way you can imagine. Polio at 18 months, which will lead to a childhood being marginalized, ignored, ostracized, and bullied. You will learn your first lesson when you understand that you are kinder than those around you. Your father will be the one who instills in you that you only have to get up one more time than you fall and he will always be there to part another Red Sea of impossibility. You will marry Bill Pinckney, who will be famous for sailing around the world solo. And when you understand his best life will be spent on the sea and yours on land, divorce him 36 years later. You will each leave the marriage better people than when you began it. And neither of you will ever forget why you loved each other. Your life experiences will read like a novel and seem a dream to many. You will hang out with Maya Angelou in Greenwich Village. You will dance with Fred Astaire. Go skydiving and class 10 whitewater rafting and scuba diving. You will ski the Alps and the Rockies on your one good leg 
feed Julia Child and Wolfgang Puck and most Chicago chefs who will grow before your eyes and make this city a world-class food destination. You will experience great kindness from Anthony Bourdain. Wipe the brow of Mikhail Baryshnikov in the wings of the ballet. Appear on a global live stream on World Polio Day to speak about the Global Polio Eradication Initiative for the Gates Foundation and Rotary. And Bill Gates will follow you on Twitter. <laughs> you will try hard to find your place in corporate America having 21 jobs and getting fired from 19 of them. But learning something from each one that you will need and use later. You will be fearless, Ina, but never reckless. And always see yourself as the causative agent in the story, never the victim. You'll bake your first cake at age 37 and find a strange and exciting joy in that. And from that one cake, you will build a baking kitchen, teach yourself how to bake, and create a dessert catering business in 1980 when that does not exist. You'll open your restaurant in 1991 at age 48 and realize there is great power in being underestimated. Ina's Kitchen will change the landscape of breakfast forever in Chicago, and it will matter. You will ultimately be known as an entrepreneur way ahead of her time, who created the smoking ban in Chicago, co-founded the Green Restaurant Coalition, and found a recipe for success in compassion, exacting standards, and sheer willpower. Ina's Kitchen will become a theater piece and a stage upon which the Ina will be reborn. Every life-changing experience you will have, every person you will meet, the family of choice you will assemble will enter through that door. You will try with all your might to fit in and like most polio survivors, pass for normal for many years until the late effects of polio take their toll first with a brace, then a cane, then a walker, and now a scooter. After a 33-year career that will bring you much joy and heartache, you will find your exit strategy and pivot to new and exciting ways to use your knowledge and experience. You will write a memoir cookbook, Ina's Kitchen. You will be the subject of an award-winning documentary called Breakfast at Ina's, now on Amazon. <laughs> You will write a monthly column in the Chicago Tribune about breakfast, breakfast with Ina. Companies will hire you to speak at conferences about breakfast. You will finally get to eat breakfast. <laughs> what you will love the most are the relationships that will sustain you, especially with the Rotarians you will meet each time you are invited to speak. You will treat each invitation as an honor and you will accept it because you will feel the grace of all you have tried to accomplish and are not six years old and are no longer afraid that you will never belong. So I came here today to share the polio story with you about a life that was very small and a life that got very, very, very big and now a life that is getting much smaller again. But mostly I came here to thank you for your donor fatigue and overriding that to keep raising money so that in my lifetime, I will see the global eradication of polio. Thank you, Rotarians. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Are you up for of course, of course. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Anybody need to know how I've danced with Fred Astaire? Yeah. Oh, is that a good one? Should we start with that? Okay. So the, the New York Film Society was honoring him way back in the early, uh, maybe seven, 1970-ish, I don't remember. And my husband bought me a ticket and it was $100 in those days, which was like $1,000. And my friend's husband bought her the same ticket and we went and we sat in the downstairs watching film clips of Fred Astaire movies. And I was sitting right behind Ginger Rogers so I could barely 
breathe the whole time. And then we went upstairs and Count Basie's orchestra was playing and everybody was having this gala. And all of a sudden I saw a big circle and I looked and Fred Astaire was in the middle of that, but there was nobody around him. And so I walked right through the circle, right up to him. And he looked at me and said, I see that you have a little trouble walking. Perhaps we'll just sway together. And so we swayed together for good 10, 12 sways. And I said, thank you so much. I call that dancing. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Anybody else need to know anything? As you can see, I'm not very withholding. <laughs> no? Yes? How did you do the jump, though? I mean, how did you become new? I mean, you had a lot of years. What made you take those steps and get motivated and just... I, I knew that if I said the word yes every time, that I would have life experiences that were not expected of me. And so I never said no. And if it was the wrong decision, we called it one and done. You know, but I always said yes. It was everything that came my way. And as you see with Fred Astaire, I didn't wait to be asked. You know, I walked right through the circle and went right up to him where nobody else was doing that. I have, as I said, I'm fearless. I'm never reckless. I plot it all out. I had trouble falling asleep last night because I needed to plot out how I was going to make it into here today because I use a scooter and I know there's a curb downstairs and I know there's a side door and then I know where, you know, I have to, everything is plotted out. When I get to the door of a room, an unknown, I have to take a really deep breath. But when I walk through the door, I know I can own that room. <laughs> Um, I chose it because people uh, uh, during the 80s, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question for our Zoom? Oh, audience? of course. Why breakfast? Why breakfast? Um, so when I started baking in the 80s, I realized um, eating out breakfast almost every day that it was mediocre and it was awful pretty awful. Um, it, you know, people were, were making some uh, eggs on a greasy griddle and coffee was insipid and somebody, you would get the coffee just barely okay that you could drink it, you know, with just the sugar and the cream and you go, oh, this is not very good, but I can get it down. And then somebody comes by and goes, you want me to warm that up for you, honey? Yeah. And if you say yes, they have ruined the cup of coffee. And if you say no, you never see her again in this life. And so I... <laughs> And I knew there had to be a better way. And I loved hotel dining rooms or club dining rooms for breakfast. And I understood diners. So I went right in the middle. I went with a fine dining restaurant, but with identifiable food, but people hadn't had it before. So if you came in and said, can I have some two eggs over easy and hash browns and whole wheat toast? I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to give you what you think you're getting, but it's going to be so much better than anything you've ever had. And sure enough, you'd say, I never had a breakfast like this. So breakfast was my thing. And I think people accept mediocre food because all the food comes out at once to the table. When you're home and making it, you're going inside to get the toast or you're going back to get more coffee or you're going in to make somebody else's eggs. So I always wanted to do breakfast in a way nobody had ever done it before. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Yes, Marga. Anthony Bourdain, and she wants to know about that. So I was on a cooking show, um, and it was called The Taste. And I was behind a door. First of all, my oven didn't work. So the dish that I was presenting to the judges was just not done. And I could hear Nigella Lawson saying, oh, whoever made this does not know how to cook. And then I heard another chef going, well, I don't know. I had a piece on the edge and it seemed like it was okay, but it's not done. And Anthony didn't say anything. And when they opened the door and they reveal this old lady standing there and I said immediately and made sure that I got it in the middle so they couldn't edit it out. I said, I'm Ina Pinkney and I have a breakfast restaurant in Chicago. And if my oven had worked, you would have had a pasta frittata today. I made sure I got it right in the middle. <laughs> 
Uh, and that answers your question also, how do I get to do everything? <laughs> and, at, and, and they said, oh, and Anthony just put his fork down and he looked at me and he said, I bet people love you and I bet they love your food and I'm so sorry today just wasn't your day. <laughs> That was it. I didn't need a thing. I didn't need anything else but that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Wes. Looking around Chicago today, excuse me, um, you were going to go to breakfast at your place of choice tomorrow. Where would it be? Who's the chef? So, where would I go? Well, I had the column and I wrote about three different places every single month, and people love that and love that. So I'm thinking of doing something else in, in media um, with that uh, with that notion. But I would go to a place up on Broadway called Mortar and Pestle. Mortar and Pestle. And they're only open, a lot of restaurants are only opening four days a week now. They found out that they can make a living four days a week instead of having all the labor and the uh, stuff for the other three. So I would go back to Mortar and Pestle because um, I think he's got an extraordinary palate and he makes me foie gras and eggs. What? <laughs> Can a girl say no? No. <laughs> no. Anybody else? Yes? Um, Julia. So I belong to the Les Dames d'Escoffier, a women's food society, and we were having our conference here in Chicago, and um, somebody said they were bringing Julia to, to lunch, and I had no idea who they were talking about. And I was standing in my restaurant, and then someone said, oh, look, there's Julia. And I turned around, and it was her, and I did the classic movie Double Take, and sat down, and we made scones. We were having high tea and I made scones and she said, oh, this is just the best and the best. And so we began to have a friendship because in that organization, you can call anybody at any time and they will answer the phone. And so when she hurt her leg, I sent her a copy of Oliver Sacks' book, A Leg to Stand On, which had helped me too because it talks about this complete disassociation you have with this injured limb. And so we had a nice long talk um, and I got to feed her one more time, one more time. And when she passed, her assistant sent me a ladle and a couple of spatulas and a pot holder from her kitchen before it went to the Smithsonian. Yeah, that was that was good. That was good. Yes. Say that again. It did not come with butter. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. I have been very outspoken about the COVID vaccine and my um, my disbelief that people won't take it. And I posted even on Facebook and all my social media that I had polio 11 years before there was a vaccine. And I believe in science and I know vaccines work. Um, and so it's been a, a challenge for me to, to talk to people who just say, well, I'm not really there yet. It's too new. I don't get it. I don't get it, you know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent. I did get something from the State Department, actually, asking if I, um, I sent them a clip of something I said about that. And they are thinking of posting it on all of the websites in the embassies around the country, around the world, because they're worried that people are not getting normal vaccines with COVID shutdowns, that they're not getting their normal vaccinations. So let's hope I'm going to go global. If they could have put it on the Mars rover, I could have been intergalactic. But <laughs> are there any questions from uh, uh, the observers? Oh, and Barishnikov also. I got a call from a friend who was a ballet mistress for the New York City Ballet. And she said, a friend of mine is um, going to be coming to Chicago to dance with Barishnikov at a big international festival. And they're not giving her a lot of stipend. So do you think she could stay with you? And I said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. And so she came and we had a swimming pool in our building. And so she brought her friends uh, from the ballet and they would swim upstairs. And uh, then she invited me to be in the wings 
And I got to watch them getting dressed and, and, and stitch their little pieces of elastic in their pink satin ribbons so that there's a little more give. And I was overwhelmed um, in the back, in the dressing room. And then I stood in the, in the wings and he was doing Apollo. And I had a, a cup of plastic cup of iced tea with a paper napkin around it, which was now sweat through and it was cold and it was damp. And he came off and on stage, he looked like he didn't even need to take a breath. And when he came off in the wings, it was like, <gasps> <laughs> and he was sweating. And I just walked up to him and I just wiped his brow and the look of joy on his face and relief. And I went, I've, I, that's it. That's it. I said to my husband, I could die tonight. It would be fine. You know, <laughs> Do we have any questions from um, the people watching in? Oh, another one. What is your breakfast? What do you You know, people have asked me what I eat for breakfast, and I have to tell you, it's the simplest, simplest things because I could never get this as a hot dish when I was working. I want two eggs, perfectly sunny side up, cooked in some olive oil. So the edges are a little crispy and the yolk is still soft. And I want really, really, really good coffee. Like and make my own latte and then perfect biscuit, a perfect biscuit with sweet butter. I'm a simple girl from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? I know. I know. Come over. We'll. Uh... <laughs> Hey, Ina. Yeah. Hey, Ina, can you? Yes. This is Roshnik from La Crosse. Hello. Oh, Roz is a Rotarian, a great Rotarian from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Hi, darling. Well, hi there. And I'm so excited to see you uh, in the club number one. Um, tell them about Heavenly Hots. This is one of my favorite stories about. <laughs> Um, okay, just for you. So I had a whole list of people that I wanted to feed and I wrote a newsletter every month and I still do. Um, it's online. I mean, I send it out on an email now. So I've been doing it every single month since 1991. Um, and I wrote that I would like to feed um, Maria Tallchief. I just had some space in Maria Tallchief, who was a first Native American prima ballerina. Um, and of, as a, a customer was leaving, she says, oh, I see you want to feed Maria. I'll bring her in next week. <laughs> what? What? And she said, I'll call you. And so she called me and said, I'll be in on Wednesday. And I, I was stunned. And I, um, I was all ready. I had a table all set up and Maria came in and she's very arthritic. She was very arthritic in her shoulders and her feet. But she walked in, you know, with that chin up and to think this was a woman who walked on point around the globe, you know, she was just amazing. And she sat down and Marion sat next to her across from me and she said, I have no idea why I'm here. <laughs> and I said, when I was three, my mom took me to the ballet de Monte Rusto de Monte Carlo, and I saw you dance, and the and the curtain opened, and I fell in love with you, and I fell in love with the ballet. And when my father would do my exercises with me, and I would say, "Daddy, Daddy, no more," he would say, "Oh, Maria Tallchief would never say that," <laughs> and I would keep going. And so I said to her, whatever mobility I have been able to, to get from this polio thing, I owe to you. And she cried and I cried. And then I made her these amazing heavenly hots pancakes that we made these small, thin, thin, delicate, because they were delicate and airy, just like she was. So, okay, Roz. Yes. It's Pancho. Oh, my God, I've been very lucky to feed almost all of them. Um, let me think about that. Um, who would I want to share a meal with? The, sh the chef here in uh, Union League Club, Mike Ponzio, I have done some work with him, and he's an extraordinary man, plus he's an excellent chef. I can't wait to eat the dessert. Um, um, I don't know. Can I get back to you on that? Oh, anywhere in the world? Oh, my God. Do you want to be at the table with us? Um, I don't know. I've had some really extraordinary meals. I don't know. I don't know. I have to think about that. I don't want to leave anybody out. Yes, Karen. On Zoom question. 
Oh, hi, Ina. My name is Richard Siegler. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, what are one or two things you would still like to accomplish ahead? Um, I am going to launch some kind of a secret media thing um, pretty soon. Um, first, because people miss my restaurant and people miss my column. And so print is out of the question right now, but um, video is not. Hint, hint. So be on the lookout. I still have some more things to, to accomplish. Thank you. Yes, Alita. Um, our culinary class is going, to, is going to be on Facebook Live. And so many of them are inspiring the chefs. My intern, Anaya, and that. And so, what advice would you give them about how to move forward in your career? I have a couple of things that I uh, try to impart when I, I speak to graduating classes. Number one, always, which has been my mantra, that it takes less energy to be courageous than it does to be afraid. And so everything I do comes from a place of courage and fearlessness. I always say that life is like baking a cake. It's raw for a really long time. And it's perfectly baked for a very short time, and it's overbaked forever. So pay attention to the times in your life when things are just perfect and go for whatever you want. Is that it? Thank you, my so dear. Much. I took up a lot of time. I'm sorry. No, you're perfect. Is that perfect. good? Oh, it's, yes. Perfect timing? We had specially assigned a lot of time for questions and answers. <laughs> Well, Ina, thank you. What what a treat for all of us here. So uh, you know, it's it's just uh, uh, so heartwarming to know that uh, nothing stops you, and that happens also to Rotarians, right? So we're not afraid of things. So uh, okay, well, I'm going to continue now with the program. Yeah, well, there is one thing that we do here uh, in Aina. And um, to our speakers, if you look at the screen, there is a certificate that we are going to send to you by mail. All right. And there is a little gift that has uh, the logo of our club. And it is a candle that uh, our past president, Eric, was uh, um, in, invited an organization called Bright Endeavors that they do work with young mothers uh, to help her in, in, in skills training so they can have temporary jobs at Bright Endeavors, but then they can go on on their own with some skills learn. And this month, Moms, you know, what well, these jobs help them take care of their kids and themselves. So stay there. Thank you. And that you will be receiving the certificate that you saw in the mail. Um, now, um, what I would like to do is continue with some information to share with you. Um, Betsy, are you there? Okay. Would you like to come and tell our members about what's happening in Guatemala? Betsy, for those of you who don't know, is a co-chair of the International Services Committee. <clears throat> and that is a committee that is involved in all the international projects that we do. So uh, my dear friend, Betsy, <laughs> will tell you about Guatemala. Yeah. Um, you know, for the last, uh, when we developed our strategic plan with Eric quite some time ago, one of the things that people really wanted to do was have service uh, opportunities. And with COVID, that's been absolutely impossible for us to go out and work on some of our projects, particularly since they're in Bolivia, which is uh, doing very badly with COVID. 
However, uh, there is a new project, not a new project, there's a project that's being done in Guatemala in November, and it's a joint project with District 6440 and 6450. It's in the gyrator, and you can sign up for this project. Uh, it's uh, the first part of the project is to go to El Rodeo, which was hit by the uh, the De Fuego volcano eruption in, uh, I think it was in 18. And uh, at that location, they'll, uh, Rotarians will be repairing one of the schools and updating it, uh, painting, uh, and uh, actually relaying a water line so that it's no longer a trip problem for the kids. Uh, and then there's another project, if enough people sign up in Antigua, where the uh, Rotarians will be building bunk beds that will then be shipped to other locations. The cost is pretty modest um, on this one. It's $12.50 a person. Uh, that's $1,250, not $12.50, but... <laughs> And it includes airfare, ground transportation, your hotel, um, breakfast and lunch every day, uh, accommodations. I'm sorry? Um, sorry, I, could, I tried to print it out and it printed out mirror image. God knows why. Uh, <laughs> November 6th and 15th. <laughs> Six to the 15th. So it's uh, 11 days, nine days. And. Uh, there's information in the gyrator to uh, contact the Rotarian who's managing this and get more information. And if you're interested in doing service trip this year and feel comfortable about going to Guatemala, it's a wonderful opportunity. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Betsy, very much. And for those of you, <clears throat> if you have been in Antigua, you know it is a truly gorgeous town you will go there and you will want to stay and live there it is so beautiful the architecture is dreamlike so um and antigua is very famous for the celebrations for easter where they do these murals with flowers on this on the main streets of the town so i highly recommend you uh recommend that you visit there or, or go on the service trip now, this is um, a service trip organized by one particular district, but then every Rotarian is invited to participate, whether you're a member of that district or the club that is sponsoring or not. So that's the beauty of Rotary. Okay, now um, we are going to have our spotlight on service, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, Betsy, you come back. <laughs> uh, back in uh, 2019, and this is well before COVID, uh, we agreed to do a project um, in Kurzima, Latvia. And uh, it, this project has finally gotten underway. There were some delays with COVID, but we did contribute to the project. And it's uh, the title of the project is providing more, more possibilities for children with disabilities. And uh, Indra, and I'm gonna mispronounce her name, I know, but that's okay. <laughs> Clavina is um, going to make a presentation to us, just an update presentation what the status of this is. And uh, Indra came to Rotary in kind of a fun way. She was in the, in the United States back in the early 90s <clears throat> excuse me, doing uh, some work with uh, in Shelton, Washington, who was forming a uh, project or a, a twin city relationship with her city in Tulsa. And uh, she had a problem. She uh, ended up having to have surgery while she was in our country. And the Rotarians gathered around her, provided blood, provided help, and all of that. And when she got back to Riga a few years, or to uh, Talsi a few years later, she formed a Rotary Club and is now still a Rotarian. She's been, and I'm going to have to read this because you've got to get the names right, District Rotary Foundation Chair for their Swedish Latvian uh, district and, and has uh, served for six years on their uh, Rotary Foundation Committee. So she's got a great deal of experience. And this is just a wonderful project. So. Indra? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to nice to see you real in reality. I have I have been uh, 
in close relation with uh, emails with some of you. And uh, we in Taos, we are really very happy to, to have also you in our project, uh, uh, besides uh, another 26 uh, Rotary clubs in, in five countries in, in the world, supporting uh, uh, children with special needs uh, in, uh, in Kurzem region uh, in Latvia. And uh, uh, this project is uh, maybe not typical because it's not uh, the, the, uh, the, it's not going on in one spot, but it's going on in uh, uh, basically in two two towns in Talsi and Liepaja. And uh, today there will be a possibility for you to to watch a small video uh, about uh, what has been done uh, in in Talsi's side. And, uh, and uh, in, in Liepaja side, uh, there is a special center uh, where very ill children, some of them are in a palliative uh, situation. Uh, they, they can have some additional uh, equipment that can be hired at home uh, in, in, in emergency situations if there is such a need. So it's, uh, it, they, these are cough assists and uh, oxygen uh, um, Equipment and and uh, and uh, perfusors for uh, for having uh, special food and so. And uh, I would be very happy if you could uh, show the small video. We added also some English English text uh, down there. Armandam ir jau 19 gadu, taču viņš ir viens no tā dēvētajiem mūžīgajiem bērniem, un to var redzēt arī šobrīd, kad viņš ratniņkrēslā pirmo reizi uzzina, ko nozīmē šūpoties, kas citiem bērniem ir paša protama bērnība sastāvu daļa. Šūpoles veidotas tā, ka Armands arī pats ar roku palīdzību var sevi šūpināt. Tiep, kurš tālsnieks ir aicināts mūsu dārzā nākt un baudīt rotaļu elementus un arī īpašo bērnu šūpoles vārtiņi ir vaļā un pieejam tālsniekiem. Tikmēr iekšā pacēlēs palīdz bērniem nokļūt hidroterapijas vannā. Tā ir zemūdens masāža ar 34 atverēm, kas nozīmē, ka var strādāt gan ar visu ķermeni, gan tikai vienu problēmu zonu. Iespēja izmantot aromterapiju, hromoterapiju, pēļu terapiju, kad mazi burbulīši iedarbojas uz ķermeni un citas opcijas. Veido mikrocirkulāciju, uzlabo locītā mobilitāti, mazina sāpes, muskuļu spāzmas. Mūsgadījumā arī bērniem spastiku varētu mazināt. Uzlabo, protams, miega kvalitāti ūdens par sevi. Brājienam, kurš pirmais talsos jauno terapiju izmēģina, vislabāk patīkot lielie burbuļi un krāsas. Viņš izbauda tik ļoti, ka mammai un fizioterapeitie pat nākas izdomāt trikus, lai pēc 20 minūtēm varētu sesiju beigt. Ieguvumu brājiena mamma jūtas jau pēc pirmās reizes. Viņš tāds mierīgs, tāds, ka viņam, kad nedēļa atvaļinājums nav visi bijis, viņš ir mierīgs, viņam viss patīk, viņam... Ne, ne liķīš, ne kas, jo viss tā diena ir ļoti, ļoti tāda relaksēta. Šī ir ne tikai terapija, bet arī metoda, ko izmantos citi brīnumiņa speciālisti, ja bērniem kādā no nodarbību reizēm nebūs, piemēram, gara stāvokļa darboties. Piemēram, mēs varam atnākt uz 5-10 minūtēm veikt šo te hidroterapijas pielietojumu, pēc tam iet uz 23 minūtēm vēl vingrot, jo viņam būs brīvāks locītās atbrīvot muskuņu un tas darbs būs pilnīgi savādāks. Lai palīdzētu brīnumiņam, iesaistījās 27 rotarī klubi no piecām valstīm, bet galva no ideju veidoja Talsu un Liepājas klubi. Tas ir rotarī globāli granta projekts, kas nozīmē, ka katram piesaistītajam eiro tika pievienots tāds pats starptautisks finansējums un kopējā summa ir vairāk nekā 50 tūkstoši eiro. Tik lielu arī mēs kā Rotary klubs talsos, kas esam tikai 13 cilvēki, mēs nekad nebijām veikuši, bet sagadošanās ilga vairāk par gadu un tagad ir pagājusi pusgads kopš tā brīža, kad mēs šo apstiprinājumu pozitīvu esam, esam ieguvuši. Projekts atbalstu sniedz arī Liepājas dižvanagiem, kas palīdz bērniem ar īpašām vajadzībām. Liepājas pusēm ir mazliet citādākas iekārtas, tur vairāk ir tādas operatīvās iekārtas, kas ir paredzētas izbraukumiem, tādas speciālas medicīniskas iekārtas un nu, ļoti specifiskām vajadzībām, elpošanas teiksim, problēmām un, un tādām lietām. Un visā kurzemē paredzētas arī apmācības speciālistiem, vecākiem un sociālo jomu darbiniekiem. Sanita Liepiņa, Terēze Matesone, Retēvē no Talsiem. So, 
Thank you once more very much. And uh, I, I know that the children are really very happy to have this. And uh, who knows, uh, as, you, as you know, people with special needs, uh, if they are children with special needs, they, they can maybe uh, reach uh, uh, this, uh, such a uh, situation that they, they, they can help afterwards other people around. So as, as we, we, we can know that, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and we're very happy to see uh, the fruits of this global grant. So congratulations from all of us. Okay. All right, next in our program, uh, I would like to invite our past media past president, Eric Kempel, to tell us about the survey that you have been filling uh, as an evaluation for uh, the year past and where we are going next year. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marga. I'll make this fast. I think in the gyrator, you've all been receiving um, a link. Uh, I believe it's on the first or second page for a survey. Uh, this is something that for the club, I think is, is very important because one of the ways that we take ownership of our club is by helping to talk about the things that we like and that we don't like and what direction you want to see the, the club go. It's a very simple survey. It should only take just a couple of minutes, but it helps us assess how we've done over the last year. And it's just kind of a touch point in the strategic plan, which we developed over a year ago. And uh, we're at, uh, I think, about 24 responses now. Uh, so we could use a lot more. So if you could please go in there, click it, tell us how you are liking or not liking things, and uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. All right, now comes the fun part where we introduce our guests, and we know that um, we start usually with international guests, but I think that, is there anybody from another country visiting us today? No. Well, on Zoom, uh, we can, uh, I see somebody here. So um, I see Liz visit, visiting us again. Um, I invite you to a short in introduction. Tell us your name and the country where you are from. And uh, we would like to hear from you. Maybe not. I see Derek Kabuye from Kampala. Yeah, um, hello. Um, good to be here again uh, this week. I was here last week with um, for a wonderful fellowship, um, and I'm, I'm very glad I've um, joined in again this week and uh, looking forward to the next fellowship again next week. Thank you so much for being with us. I see Ronnie Corin from Sydney. Good morning. I'm not actually calling to Sydney today, I'm actually in Canberra where I'm doing a house sit. Apologies for not having the camera on. The little puppy dog I'm looking after is getting a little bit anxious if I get out of bed. She's rather curled up with me. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, Ronnie. It's good to see you. You're a loyal uh, follower of our meeting. So it's great to have you again. Now I would like to proceed with the guests that we have here uh, in person at the Union League Club. And um, okay, so we have uh, Connor's friend, Varu. Thank you. My name is Varma, and I'm a professor I'll do this again. My name is Arup Varma, and I'm a professor at Loyola Chicago. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Connor. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm actually a club member in Florida, so I figured I would let my, my guests come first. But uh, my name is Nick Bashaga. Uh, my wife, Brittany, and I are both members of the Delray Beach, Florida Club. And it's very nice to be here in Chicago, and we're excited. And it was a pleasure meeting with you as well. So. And give it to you next. 
I think you said it all. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be here. Britt Stanford Bishaga from Delray by way of Boston, where I'm from originally, and excited to be at Rotary One. It's very special to us. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, my name is Mike. I am Nick's brother and business partner. This is my girlfriend, Catherine. Uh, we also live in Delray Beach, Florida. Originally grew up <clears throat> right outside Chicago in Whiting, Indiana. Uh, and it is great to be back in Chicago. You know, with the past 12, 18 months, uh, we've been, you know, hunkered down in Florida. But it feels so great to be back out seeing people traveling a little bit and hope to continue that even more uh, as things continue to get better. So thanks for having us. Hello, everyone. I'm Colin O'Brien. I'm from Chicago, and I was invited by email through a blast. So I just came here by myself, but it was a wonderful meeting people. I loved your your your, your speech. It was very inspiring. Uh, I'm going to talk to my kids about what, what, what I heard from you today. It's very nice meeting everybody, and uh, hopefully I'll be attending more meetings. Thank you. Thank you. We need to see who else is here on the Zoom call. Well, are, are any of you in the Zoom call from other clubs? Would you please uh, say your name, please? I'm Bob McLean. I'm with Central Lakes Rotary, uh, past district governor from District 5580, and currently Zone 29 and Polio Now uh, co-chair. Welcome. Thank you for being with us today. And, and we had the honor of having John Huco give a presentation to us at our district conference virtually this past spring on positive peace. He did a wonderful job. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. No surprise. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Well, I guess uh, this is it for now with other guests. And um, uh, I would like to continue with other announcements. One thing I would like to congratulate is uh, Connor Gee on our member spotlight on success because Connor has recently become the director of marketing for the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. So Connor, congratulations on your great promotion. <laughs> And for all those of you who don't know yet, but uh, in a couple of years, Connor is going to be our district governor. So two big jobs at the same time. So <laughs> thank you so much for your service, Connor. <laughs> All right, and our friend Natalie Loma, as some of you know, uh, she is having the grand opening of her boutique uh, at the Nordstrom's, uh, uh, it's the Northbridge Mall in Michigan Avenue, where Nordstrom's is located. So we are going to gather for our Thursday evening uh, event at her boutique on Thursday, July 15th at 5.30 p.m. So uh, just check, um, you know, you need to register for that at rotary rotary1.org club how you do regularly so we know how many of you will be coming but come because um, she's doing really gorgeous dresses so if you're a gentleman we don't think you can go shopping for okay <laughs> so and i would like to bring sarah now so you can tell us about what is happening uh, with the community services committee thank you sarah Good afternoon. I am Sarah Buck, co-chair of the Community Service Committee with Wes Westerfield. And I'm here to talk about the Jesse White Trunk Party and the Fernando Jones Blues Camp. But I'd also like to plug Natalie Loma's store because her dresses are beautiful. So if you have a chance to go, please go because they are beautiful. Each year, Rotarians from our club volunteer at the Jesse White Trunk Party at the Jesse White Community Center, which is an event that puts together duffel bag care packages for incoming college freshmen. This is an excellent hands-on service opportunity where duties include sorting products and packing the duffel bags full of items that a college freshman staying in a dorm for the first time would 
need, including bedding, hygiene products, laundry detergent, uh, linens, so although ordinarily there is a party celebrating the recipients this year, there will be a drive through pickup instead. So this Friday, uh, July 16th from three till seven, volunteers are needed to help transport items from the second floor of the community center down to the first floor. Um, and then once all the items have been moved, they are organized and packed into 500 bags. Sounds like a lot, but there's a lot of volunteers, so it's very efficient. On Saturday, this Saturday, volunteers will finish any packing that still needs to be done and then transport the bags outside to flatbeds for distribution. It's important to note that masks are required um, and water will be provided. So that's this Friday and Saturday, and there's more information um, and a link to register in the gyrator. And then, uh, as I mentioned, I'm the, the co-chair of the Community Service Committee, and uh, one of the projects that we funded last year was the Fernando Jones Blues Camp, and it's a week-long music education camp that just finished, and uh, we sponsored the scholarship winner uh, with his hotel stay. So Eric and I went on Friday, and it was amazing. It was a great event. We got to meet the award winner. Uh, he, he goes by the name of Boogie Boy, I think was right. Yeah, so he's, he's 12, and uh, uh, a keyboardist. Oh, there you see. Um, and so Eric and I got to hear uh, him play. And also, as an aside, it's not just the kids that perform at this um, sort of finale. Um, they also have a blues mamas and papas band. So Eric and I were standing off to the side and was like, you know, there's, you know, pretty good number of Rotarians in our club that probably play some instruments. So maybe next year at the Fernando Jones Blues Music Camp, maybe we can get a rotary band together and then we can play at Reggie's and at this finale's event as well. Yeah? So I'm very excited about that. All right, thank you. Okay, don't feel intimidated. Everybody can play drums, right? So I think if we cannot do that, we have a problem, all right? <laughs> so, well, now I would like to bring to the mic um, Laura Inns, the, our Uber chair of the membership committee. And uh, so Laura is going to tell us something about membership. <laughs> Thank you, Marga. So I'm Laura Inns, and here's the thing about membership. The more members we have, the more fun things we can do. So if we want to sponsor more kids um, in, in any kind of camps, if we want to send more money to various places across the world, the more members we have, the more power we have. So today, my ask of all of you is to think about who you can invite to bring, whether it's in person or Zoom. And the great part right now via Zoom, no travel time, no cost time. People can just hear our speakers and get a taste of it. So it's a great way, you know, like if it, um, I forgot to look up who's coming up next. Um, who's speaking at our next event? Do you remember? Jeff Baju. Oh, right, with the Entrepreneur Series. Yeah. So if you know any young entrepreneurs, this would be a great um, time to invite them to next week's presentation to see how other entrepreneurs are doing. Very inspirational. Um, so let's all think about who we can invite and keep growing our clubs because the momentum has been great. So it's been hard to see, by the way, since we haven't like seen each other very much and since it's not quite the same. But our membership is really on the upswing. And, and I know it sounds like we have a couple of interested parties here today that I will talk to shortly. Um, <laughs> I apologize. I might seem like a little vulture at the end of this meeting. It's because I am. <laughs> but um, so let's do what we all can. And um, thank you to those of you who've joined us today. Thank you, Laura, very much. Uh, she's doing amazing work, so those of you who are guests will not escape, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I'd like to see if uh, John Willem, are you still here in the call? Mm, I don't see John. 
Okay, well, I'm going to tell you because John was going to try to be here with us to talk about uh, the global and virtual um, uh, um, a Safe Heaven Run Walk that is going to be sponsored by uh, the, our Community Service Committee. Um, and this is going to be the second annual a Safe Heaven Run Walk to End Homelessness. It is going to be on Saturday, July 17th through Sunday, July 25th. Unfortunately, as you may know, the need to help raise awareness to support the homeless has never been more urgent because around the world, COVID has caused the homeless numbers to rise at an alarming rate. Proceeds will go to support helping to prevent and to transform lives from homelessness to self-sufficiency with pride and purpose. Special pre and post event live shows, interactive charge running course app. Uh, uh, there's an interactive charge running course application and registration registration is required and kids can sign up for free to run or walk okay so we have a rotary team uh, our member lisa russ is the contact person and if you join uh, the rotary team uh, there is a five dollars off promo code rotary club okay so you may see uh, did we see the link already uh, or the slide for the run but uh, you know, con contact Lisa and she's going to give you more details. Uh, about our upcoming meetings, I invite you to check our website, rotary1.org. And um, as, as we said earlier in the meeting, please register as soon as possible so you can, by Thursday, 3 p.m., we would love to know if you're coming next Tuesday. Uh, the speaker has a very, very interesting and inspiring story to tell. Um, then uh, the Rotary One committees uh, are continuing to meet virtually and the meeting dates are on the calendar. Uh, members are invited to participate in committee meetings and get involved and feel free to call um, uh, and contact the committees with any questions. I invite especially the new members, I think that some of the new members are very involved already and if you don't belong to a committee, I highly recommend it because we are having a lot of fun with the work that we are doing. All right, and also you're going to see in the gyrator that um, we have uh, also upcoming committee meetings, uh, PR and marketing meets on this Thursday at 4 p.m. The International Service Committee meets on the Wednesday the 21st of July at 5.30 p.m. And the Community Service Committee meets on Thursday, August 5th at noon. All right, so, um, and as I said earlier, July 15th, we look forward to seeing you at Natalie's um, grand opening at her boutique on Michigan Avenue. And as always, every Friday, we have the Rotary uh, Roundtable, the networking roundtable here at the Union League Club on the fourth floor. And everybody's invited and you pay what you consume with your credit card. All right. And, and I think, uh, well, as we said on the 20th, we have Jeff Badu, and on July 27th, we have Alan Wissenberg, who is the founder of Munich-based travel, of the, of the Munich-based travel company, Uraid. So now the last is to uh, recite the four-way test for the things we say and do. So I invite Mr. and Mrs. Bashiaga to come and read the four-way test with for us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hello again. So of the things we say and do, think, say, and do, number one, is it the truth? <laughs> number two, is it fair <laughs> to all concerned? <laughs> Number three, will we'll 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 and better friendships. friendships. Number four, we'll will be beneficial we'll to all concerned. And just to throw it in there in Delray Beach, we like to do number five, will be fun. Because real <laughs> Rotary is a lot of fun. So the more you meet. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you for your hospitality. <laughs> you. All right, and with this, I close the meeting today. Thank you, everybody. Okay. <laughs>